Man, this is gonna take a while. Hello and welcome to Generation 16, the series that showcases the history of Sega's Mega Drive. I'm your host, Greg Seward. Hi, I'm Greg Seward. Welcome to a special episode of Generation 16. This isn't something I normally do. You normally don't see me on the camera, actually. That's that's a that's a big deal um, for me, anyway. So uh, please bear with me. I'm still sort of figuring out my lighting and audio and everything like that down here in the game room. Uh, I went out and bought a ring light and realized about um, <laughs> five minutes after setting it up that glasses and ring lights don't agree with each other. Um, you know, one of those things that I'll learn as I as I go along. Anyway, Generation 16, of course, is mainly a, well, it is, not mainly, a series about uh, Sega's Mega Drive and Genesis. Uh, and, of course, just in general, their 16-bit um, uh, console. So... When this, well, when it, the things I want to talk about this episode, when they came out, I, I really wasn't going to do much about it. I wasn't going to do anything about it with Generation 16 because, again, the focus is the Mega Drive and the Genesis. And uh, most of the stuff that I'm about to talk about has to do with the Saturn. However, um, it's some pretty interesting revelations. They were some pretty interesting revelations with these some leaked documents and uh, a, a, a talk from... Uh, Shoichiro Irojimi, um, from a couple of years ago, or last year, I think. And people have been asking me to chime in. So I figured, hey, why not? Let's do that. I want to do some more on-camera work with Generation 16 anyway, and this is a good a good chance to, uh, to do it. So what am I talking about? So uh, a few weeks ago, as of this recording, there was a leak. I believe it came through uh, segaretro.org, uh, where they just posted at about 272 pages and they were documents that a collector actually bought off eBay and has been trying to um, get uh, uh, um, recorded and archived uh, for years now. And they finally just dumped scans of these documents. And what this is, is a fiscal year 1997 uh, brand review for Sega of America. Um, and so it's pretty interesting stuff. And I'm not going to go through it page by page. If you're looking for something like that, I highly recommend... Uh, uh, Pandemonium, uh, Pandemonium's channel in general, the, he's a YouTuber who has been, uh, reviewing every American, uh, Sega Saturn release in chronological order. He does fantastic work. He did like a three hour stream going through every page of this. Um, and if that's what you're looking for, I highly recommend his channel. I recommend his channel anyway. He does great work. Um, but that's where you're going to get details. What I wanted to do for this is sort of go through some of the things that I I took away from reading this. So, um, as much as I'm a Genesis and Sega CD fan, I am a huge Sega Saturn fan. Uh, I consider it one of the greatest consoles. It had an amazing library. Um, I find it also a very interesting point in um, video game history, as I know a lot of people do, because, of course, Sega was riding high going into the 32-bit, 64-bit generation and the fight with Sony and Nintendo and the Nintendo 64 as well. And it just, it crumbled in, in, in North America, it crumbled so fast. And so a lot of those stories have come out over the years, sort of behind the scenes, but this paints a really, one of the clearest pictures we've ever seen as far as sort of the, the state of Sega of America uh, in the mid nineties. Um, so looking through this, there were a couple things that uh, I found really interesting. First of all, the very first page is a, a handwritten um, a map, a plan, of what their E3, I think, 96, uh, yeah, it's 96, um, booth is meant to look like. And right off the bat, the first thing I noticed, and you, and I noticed this right through all of the documentation, is uh, it's so sad. <laughs> They're still counting on Sonic. They're still counting on Sonic Extreme uh, to sort of be their big uh, mascot sort of tentpole game of the year. Uh, this is also the same year that Nights came out, Nights into Dreams. And uh, there's a lot of talk throughout the documentation about separating Nights from Sonic 
and making sure they don't sort of uh, cannibalize each other as well as co-marketing them um, in later in the year uh, as the Christmas push happens. So kind of interesting to, to, to see that. Um, the other thing that I think is important, and this will also come into play later on in this uh, video, is uh, there's clearly where it's a fiscal year report, there's a lot of sales information in here. And while the 32X was a disaster, the Sega CD wasn't selling anymore, the Pico wasn't selling anymore, uh, the Nomad wasn't really selling, the Game Gear was on its way out, um, the Genesis was still quite healthy. Uh, it was still selling, I think, in the millions. And um, I think it accounted, even in, in, nine, in the 96 fiscal year, accounted for like 30% of Sega's sales, which I think was, again, it's a really big point for what we're going to talk about later. But I think in general, it was interesting to see that because, of course, we always, we heard um, through the years, with especially talking about the 32X debacle, how Sega of America didn't want to uh, um, kill off their Genesis market in North America. And uh, I think this goes a long way in proving that it was still a pretty healthy market. So um, that that was pretty interesting as well. The other thing um, that, sorry, this is going to shake the camera while I'm moving this, I just realized. The other thing I noticed is um, we've also heard for years how the communication between Sega of America and Sega of Japan had kind of started to break down. And uh, I feel like throughout this document, you see that a lot. Um, you see it a lot with uh, the Netlink, uh, which at this point they still didn't have a name for. But there are emails in this documentation as well, where you've got a lot of Sega of America executives going back and forth on the fact that they don't even have sort of a mock-up of the Netlink to start creating uh, um, marketing materials and they don't necessarily have all the details they need. And I don't think it's even been approved for use in North America at this point. Uh, but they're also in the middle of putting together a marketing plan for it. And again, they were the Saturn was struggling at this point anyway. Um, so they were hinging a lot of their marketing on, we're going to be online. Like the Saturn is going to take you online, something that the PlayStation is not going to do, something that the N64, whenever it comes out, or actually it would have been out by now, is not going to do. Um, so, again, there was that. There was uh, Knights. They had seen Knights a little bit. They weren't totally crazy about it. And this will also come back a little bit later on in the discussion. Um, they were asking for changes, which I've seen on the internet. Uh, some people uh, making comments like, you know, well, yeah, sure, we'll just ask you to change your flagship game. Like, that never happens. That happened all the time. Um, I mean, you can look at specific examples uh, for, well, Nintendo and Sega. I mean, Super Mario Bros. 2 was a complete change from what that game was in Japan. Um, Decap Attack was a complete change from what that game was in Japan. Uh, but even things like Final Fight and Streets of Rage, you know, there were always a DJ boy. There were always constantly uh, uh, content changes between games from Japan and the U.S. So that's one of the takes that I've seen online that I, I kind of, I'm not really sure where that comes from. Um, you know, they, Sega was worried that Knights didn't really uh, speak to their demographic, which I actually tend to agree. As much as I love Knights, I tend to agree. Um, you know, Sega had spent the last five years, Sega of America had spent the last five years courting the MTV generation and being cool. And then you had Knights. Again, great game but not something you put in front of uh, the MTV crowd, you know, young men, that's what we're really talking about here, uh, and say, this is really cool. Not really something you can do. And I don't think they could. I don't think they did. Um, they didn't focus on the character very much. Um, this is at a time, of course, where Sonic was still one of the most popular characters and remains to this day one of the most widely recognized and popular video game characters around. And uh, then they were asked to shift gear to this weird Knights thing um, that, anyway, we'll get into that a little bit more later. But the other thing that they call out is, of course, Knights, the big push there was to uh, get the analog controller in people's hands. And they didn't have an analog controller. They didn't really know what was going on with that yet. Uh, it, it's just called out multiple times in, this, uh, in these documents. And uh, I, I think it really speaks a lot. 
The other thing that you'll see that you see in these documents as far as uh, communication breakdown is there's a lot of confusion around when certain games are going to be out. And it seems very clear. And again, I'll touch on this a little bit later, too. It seems very clear that um, there's no consideration being given by Sega of Japan for important American sales seasons. Um, you see a lot of things like I believe it was Sega Rally and Virtual Copper both listed in here that are coming out sometime in December is all they know. Well, sometime in December is too late in North America. Um, so again, you know, and I, I don't, I don't know Japanese shopping habits as much, but of course here in North America, especially in the United States, if you want that Christmas boost, you need to be out in November. You need to be out for Black Friday, basically. Uh, not necessarily Black Friday, but you know, North, uh, American Thanksgiving is current sort of where the American Christmas shopping season begins. And if you're going to release something in late December, you've missed it completely. And if you're if you're Sega and you have a system like the Saturn in the position that it was in sales wise and competition wise, releasing Sega Rally on December 27th is not helping you. Um, so again, we'll get into that a little bit later because I have I have thoughts on Sega America versus Sega of Japan. That's really what spurred this video on. But I wanted to go through this stuff. But either way. Um, the communication and the cooperation seems to have broken down. You can see this all throughout this document. It's it's extremely clear, uh, and this is hardcore evidence outside of the people who were there saying communication had broken down. Which I mean, you've had Tom Kalinsky say that. You've you've had uh, Ellen uh, Van Buskirk, Ellen Beth Van Buskirk saying that. You've had Steve Race, who went on to launch the PlayStation in North America, say that. Uh, it's not just Tom Kalinsky, but anyway. Um, the other thing that's very clear in these documents, actually going back to the emails for a minute, you can really see that Tom Kalinske and everybody, but Tom Kalinske, because that's where the emails are coming from. There's sort of a desperation and frustration in all of his emails that uh, you can see he, he, he knows we're screwed. We're screwed. And um, he's sort of demand at various points he's sort of demanding you know why things aren't being done right and he's got his staff coming back at him and saying like look which is the next point i want to make we don't have any budget we don't have any marketing budget there's a whole section about marketing in this documents that calls out that i think they're working with about a quarter of the budget that they used to work with also marketing telling him like you know we used to just deal with sega of america now we're now we're doing marketing for sega of europe we're doing marketing for sega soft Sega PC, all that sort of thing. Uh, and it's just, yeah, it's rough. Um, a huge piece of information here, again, which we always knew, but having hard numbers against it uh, really calls it out. And, and I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Sega of America was stretched so thin, which we've always said, and we always knew. Uh, at the, this point, just to sort of rattle it off, they were supporting the Genesis. They were supporting the 32X, not so much anymore. They had the Sega CD on the market. They had the Sega Pico on the market. They had just launched the Nomad, which based on the sales numbers in here, which we already knew, but again, did not look good. Um, they had got Sega Soft and Sega, Sega PC going at that point. Game Gear was still on the market. And the thing that really uh, becomes clear here, two things. First of all, based on North American retailer uh, uh, rules, where you had to have, most retailers wouldn't carry your product if you didn't have like 50,000 units in a warehouse somewhere to make sure you have backup. Also, buybacks, I believe, uh, is a lot of the problem that happens here. There are warehouse allocation pages in here for each system that are eye-watering. Like, if you look at Game Gear, which again, market was flat at that point. Plus they cannibalized it a little bit with the Nomad. Nobody knew if the Nomad was a replacement for the Game Gear. Between hardware and software, something like over a million units sitting in warehouses and rotting. Um, like it's, it's staggering, the numbers. And I think I, I went through and did some quick math, which I'm, I'm sort of referring to my notes here, excuse me for a minute. But in general, millions and millions of units that just uh they're just sitting there and what that says to me 
uh, more than anything, is that Sega of America, and maybe Sega in general, but Sega of America didn't have a roadmap to elegantly wind down uh, these consoles. They had too many, absolutely. Um, but I mean, in this in this fiscal uh, year '96 review, they're they're already talking about the scrap value of the 32X. And um, yeah, it's just, I, I don't have the number in front of me here, but in general, I was amazed at the millions and millions of, of units they had uh, of stock they have just sitting in warehouses that are never going to move. The Genesis was still moving. The, um, the Saturn obviously was still moving, not as fast as they wanted it to, but everything else, they just had stuff no one was ever going to buy. So, the biggest revelation for me, and I think, and I've heard other people say this, and I agree with them, um, I think we as sort of retro gamers and, and, and video game nerds in general, there's a very small subset of us that even consider sports games. Um, when we talk retro games, a lot of people don't talk sports games. But, I think reading this document, it's really important to keep in mind that Sega was along with, I'd say, Electronic Arts, was um, one of the two, yeah, I'd say they were the two, that made sports games important on home consoles. Uh, there was a lot going on on the PC as well. But um, in general, they, the Genesis was built on sports games. A lot, of the, a lot of the Genesis success in North America had everything to do with Madden, had, and in Canada had to do with uh, NHL. But there was, you know... Sega had a really healthy competition going with uh, Electronic Arts. And so it's a huge, important part of their market. The Joe Montana football, you know, was a huge franchise for them. Um, and their World Series baseball franchise, also a huge franchise for them. I think World, uh, Joe Montana had switched to Deion Sanders at this point. But point being, sports were important. And it's staggering to me, reading this document, that somehow Sega of America hadn't planned for this, hadn't put the pieces in place so that they could control their destiny when it came to, came to sports. If you remember in the late 90s, like I said, in the early 90s, you had a couple major players, and they were they were basically Sega and Electronic Arts, EA Sports. They were releasing most of the sports games uh, on the Genesis in particular, but even across the Genesis and Super Nintendo, most of the major sports games were coming from Electronic Arts. And a few other companies were dabbling, and Nintendo was sort of dabbling a little bit uh, with the Super Nintendo as well. But in the late 90s, like Sony had 989 Sports, Virgin had its own sports label. Fox had its own sports label. Nintendo had its own sports label. Everybody was releasing sports games. They were a huge market. They were a market that Sega built probably 50% of, and they were left out in the cold. There's, there's so much, there, there's a whole section in this documentation that calls out the fact that they're, so ill-prepared to release sports games. The sports games they are releasing are super low quality. They mentioned NHR All-Star Hockey, which was a terrible game. It was developed by Gray, Mar Gray Matter. It was not a good game. Uh, what success it did see, I would say, it was only because there was nothing else on the Saturn uh, as far as hockey went. Gray Matter was also creating their football game. No, sorry, not their football game, their NBA game, using the same engine, again, that was a terrible engine. There's a whole section in here about how Sega feels like they need to, to save their NFL game, they need to send their own developers up to Grey Matter, which I believe was based in Canada, um, to try to save this game. They don't have a football game. Again, Joe Montana Football, huge franchise for the Genesis and Master System. I think it was on Game Gear. Sega CD, the Joe Montana Football was terrible, but it was a big deal. Um... And again, like I said, Deion Sanders, and I think they had an NCAA football game at that point. They had, I don't know if they'd purchased or they'd farmed out 
development for their NFL game to, uh, I, I want to say it was, who was it? I've got it listed here somewhere. But anyway, it was terrible. It's terrible to the point that in this in this documentation, they're talking about killing it and searching for insurance alternatives, maybe selling it to a third party, but just saying that it will it will further erode their brand uh, if they try to release this. Um, I do not get how something that was so important to their success in the early 90s was completely overlooked somehow by Sega. Sega of America, I'm saying, I'm, I'm pushing, putting the blame center right on them. There's a, there's a quote from this documentation. I might throw the page up here. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how much editing I'm going to do with this. There's a quote here that says, sports drove Sega Genesis success. Sports is now a liability on Saturn. I mean, that says everything. How do you not get ready for this? So further to that, the other thing that is pointed out multiple times in this documentation, sports, sports games, to be successful not always, but this is an important piece, is they need, they're seasonal. You know, I mean, they're released every year still to this day. But, you know, you release your NFL game, and excuse me, I don't know exactly when all these seasons start. You release your NFL game during the NFL season or right before the NFL season. You release your NASCAR games like Daytona in February, because that's the, when the Daytona 500 happens. You want to release it around then. Um, you know, basketball, you release the beginning of the season. Hockey, you release at the beginning of the season. Baseball is a long season. If you're not going to release it in, around the beginning of the season, you're aiming for the All-Star Weekend. You want to be out before the All-Star Weekend because that's the weekend in baseball. And they have uh, uh, calendars and charts all throughout this, docu this, this leaked document that points out that none of their sports games are releasing in the sweet spot. Most of them are releasing off-season. That's crazy. So you're also talking about low-quality games, which they've admitted to, but they don't even have the extra chance to succeed based on fervor and excitement around that actual season. And um, I think it's further exacerbated by, you know, again, we always knew Sega wasn't prepared for this. But even if you look at the Saturn's launch in May 95, there were six launch games. Two of them were sports games because, again, sports was important to Sega consoles. One of them is Pebble Beach which is okay. It's an all right game. I'm going to go ahead and say golf is not the most popular spectator sport in North America. Uh, and the other one was worldwide soccer, which again, apparently quite a good game. I don't have a lot of experience with it. Uh, and soccer is getting more popular now, 30 years later in North America. I'm going to go ahead and guess that it was what? Fifth or sixth highest, seventh highest in North America back in 1995. Um, but that's what was available. That's what was ready. Uh, and again, there's more about the communication between Sega of America and Sega of Japan here, not being able to get dates out of things. The World Series baseball was not being released at the proper time. I have no idea when the baseball season happens in Japan. It might be off from uh, the, the American season, but either way, releasing it on time in Japan doesn't help for North America. So just, yeah, not one game in the seasonal sweet spot. They had no centralized sports development group. I still, I do not understand how that happens. Sega of America spent so much time building up and creating studios in the early 90s. How they don't have a sports studio is beyond me. Um, and, you know, it's being made worse by the fact that everyone else has a sports brand. A lot of people are creating good sports games now. And Sega's being left behind. Um, yeah, Konami, Virgin, Sony, EA Sports. Crazy, crazy stuff. I'm just going to scroll down my list here. Um, oh, Microprose was the company that was making the NFL game that was so terrible. So, yeah, a lot to take away from this document that I just sort of wanted to sit here and rant about. Um, I'm just going to go over my, my, my notes here real quick to make sure that I have everything pointed out. Actually, yeah. So going back to the, the roadmap thing. Um, actually, no, you know what? We'll get back to that. So one of the reasons that I wanted to do this video as well is after this document came out, there was, and I forget which site posted it, but there were uh, some excerpts from a talk that uh, Shoichiro Iremajiri gave, I think in 2022, where he 
talked about Sega of America uh, and the relationship. And um, it's been making the rounds as well. And and I'm not here to to do to deal with internet drama. I don't care. That's not something that I I, uh, I care for at all. Some of the takes I've seen, I really don't agree with, but people are 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 entitled to their own opinions. Um, but if you've been watching Generation 16 for a long time, you uh, you know that the context is a big deal for me. Just having sort of one or two pieces of information and drawing a conclusion about uh, the, the sort of the, the, the market in the early 90s and mid 90s, to me, doesn't make a lot of sense. One of the things that I try to do with the games that I cover on the show is sort of put them in uh, in context of the time around them. You know, what what are the big news stories? What is the competition doing? That sort of thing. What is the recent history of this company? Uh, and so I feel like these Irimajiri quotes, uh, when they're not given the right context, I think you come up with some weird conclusions. But again, everyone's entitled to their own conclusions. I'm just here to share mine. So one of the things that he... Well, I'll start with the big thing, because um, I only really have one major thing I want to talk about moving forward. But Shochiro Iramijiri, just to let you know who he is, he is the person who succeeded Tom Kalinske after Kalinske resigned from Sega. For years now, we've um, understood that he resigned from Sega sort of as a result of the Saturn surprise launch debacle and the fact that just could never never recover. Um, so he left. Yuri Majiri took over for him. Yuri Majiri was previously the president of Honda of America, I believe. Um, so he was there to sort of steward uh, the Saturn. And I, I don't remember how long he stayed there. Of course, Bernie Stoller eventually came in while the Saturn was still around. So I don't think Yuri Majiri was around very long. Um, I could be wrong. Maybe Stoller was there at the same time and I'm just mixing up job titles. Anyway, the major bombshell that he dropped in this talk <clears throat> was that Tom Kalinske didn't leave of his own accord. Uh, not really. He was pressured to leave. Uh, he was given, because, because of the terrible financial situation Sega was in, he was given a year to sort of restructure the company. And from what Ida Majiri said in this talk, he just didn't do it. It wasn't, or he, it wasn't progressing the way Sega wanted it to. Sega, of, Sega of Japan wanted it to, so he was asked to resign. Now, um, I think again, context. I think in general for this and the next thing that I'm going to talk about, and the reactions that I'm seeing online about it is that uh, I've already seen people online saying like, "Oh, Kalinsky's always sold this as he chose to leave, and he wasn't forced out." And true, that's true. But I mean, I don't know how many people out there would ever have said I was forced out, especially where Kalinsky wasn't at the end of his career. He was moving on to something else. He was still running other companies. Um, I don't know that I wanted to, I would want to tout that. And it's not weird for executives who are being pushed out the door, you know, to be given the, the common courtesy of the world not knowing they're being pushed out the door. Um but what I was about to say is we're in a weird place in in sort of video game history and retro game history, especially when it comes to Sega. And I think we have been ever since Console Wars, the book Console Wars was released. Because as much as I loved Console Wars and as much as it gave us some great insight into the workings of Sega of America, which is important because when you look at video game history, it's been recorded so much better in Japan. There's so much more... Uh, detail about what's happened in Japan. Japanese games have been dominating the market for so long. Those are usually the developers that are uh, interviewed. Those are, you know, it's just, we're, we know a lot more about it. So when Console Wars came out, it was really exciting because there were so many details and interviews given with members of Sega of America and American developers and American publishers um, because Sega of America was so important uh, to the success of the Genesis. That was, you know, they, they did better than Sega of Japan when it came to the Mega Drive. Um, but the problem I think that has arose from that is that it was written in a dramatic style. It wasn't written as a series of dry interviews, although there was a, uh, a documentary based on it called Console Wars, which is all about that. 
it was written in a dramatic style, sort of like a fly on the wall uh, with conversations that were recreated from memories. And I think a little bit dramatized as well that made it a fun read. But the takeaway from that is that Tom Kalinske was kind of deified in that book. Uh, and even in that, even in the console wars documentary, he is, I, I, don't have it, I don't know where I wrote it down here, but in Console Wars, when they first announce that Kalinsky uh, joined um, Sega of America, they literally call him a miracle worker or something like that. Like, his title on screen is Miracle Worker or something along those lines. Um, which I think has led to a bit of a backlash because Console Wars got so much ink uh, and... Kalinsky and others sort of went on the interview circuit and they got to sort of control the narrative. And the narrative is always, was always a little bit like Sega of America knew what it was doing. Sega of Japan didn't. They were angry that Sega of America was so successful. And so they took over and everything got screwed up. From their point of view, I'm sure that's true. Um, but there hasn't been a lot of pushback from anyone to say that's not really what happened. And so I think uh, we as a community, a lot of us anyway, have gotten to the point that we're kind of waiting for someone to say, oh, maybe Kalinsky and Sega of America weren't these geniuses and maybe they 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 carry some blame here. And I think that's why these Irimajiri quotes have really uh, gained traction. Um, so knowing that Kalinsky was sort of forced out it is huge, but I also think it's weird to to say, "Oh, ha 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 ha!" I knew he was, I knew he was uh, lying. Anyway, the main thing I want to talk about, and this is this is going to be the main thing I'm going to continue to talk about in the rest of this episode, is Yidamajiri, uh mentions something about the 32x. 32x obviously very controversial. It was a huge failure. Um, I got a couple 32x boxes sitting right back there. There we go. Um, huge failure has a bit of a muddied history because people from Sega of America say that there was pressure from Japan to release this thing. People who are listening to the, the people that you hear from Sega of Japan say it was a completely an American thing. Um, Itamajiri and his quote is interesting because, of course, he was a Sega of America person, but he came in after the 32X debacle. And so I wanted to read this and sort of get into this. It's the 32X and the Saturn launch in the U.S. sort of rolled into one. So bear with me because I'm going to read the whole quote here because I want to make sure that uh, it's all mentioned. So in this talk, Itamajiri says, however, in America... They didn't want to go that direction. The context here is talking about releasing the Saturn in 1994. Releasing the Saturn in 1994. The Genesis had been so successful and third parties were still in the middle of developing games for it. Therefore, before releasing a next generation 3D capable console, they wanted to release an enhancer for the Genesis that would boost its capabilities. That's important. He's talking about Sega of America here. This is where things got messy. Since we wouldn't be able to release the Saturn in America, I was told to go there and help resolve the situation. I had just joined Sega at the beginning of 19, July 1993, and by the middle of July, I flew out to Sega of America. I still didn't have a good understanding of the game industry, so I was just going to listen to what they had to say. I met with Sega of America President Tom Kalinske and Head of Software Development Joe Miller. They told me that there was no way they could abandon the incredible, incredible success of the Genesis they made this clear to me in a very passionate manner after that I returned to Japan. It turned out to be a huge strategic blunder and it would cost us heavily in the very end. The American third parties that were counting on the next generation hardware were thrown into great confusion and they ended up going to the PlayStation. They didn't continue on to the Saturn. So here's there's two things here. One is that Yorimajiri is hinting, I don't know that he comes out outright and says it, but he's hinting that Sega of Japan wanted to release the Saturn sort of day and date with uh, in, in North America. So that would have been, uh, what, November 1994, which is uh, seven months earlier than it came out here. 
and uh, almost a full year before it was scheduled to come out here and before the PlayStation came out here. So, uh, and then also laying the blame completely, saying that the reason they didn't do that is because Tom Kalinske and Joe Miller uh, of Sega of America said, we don't want to do that, but we want we want to do this interim step um, called the 32X, which kind of lays the 32X debacle completely at the feet of, of Sega of America. That's one of the things I have a problem with here. Um, there was also an article that I saw released on another, uh, uh, an excerpt released on another website from uh, the Nikkei Shinbun on Sega of America in 1998, where uh, they say the 32X was handled by Sega's North American subsidiary, whose president had managed to persuade Nakayama, who was the Sega, uh, Sega of Japan president, to let him sell the add-on. However, soon after that, the president was allowed to resign at his own convenience, we now know that's not necessarily true, without being called on to take blame for the failure. Nakayama is famous for his management style of sure punishment or reward, but this sharp intuition for the arcade industry failed him when it came to the home console industry, where he lacked experience. Because of that, he allowed some executives to run solo. There's some truth in that, because there was also an, inter uh, an interview that came out recently uh, with Hideki Sato, who was the head of uh, consumer... Uh, manufacturing development in Japan, um, who said the same thing. Nakayama was actually convinced to get into consoles in general. He didn't want to. We're talking way back in the SG-1000, way back in the early 80s. Um, so that is true. He was not a console guy. Sega was a tech company. Um, so what I want, what I want to say about this is that I, there's two things. And again, I'm, I'm reading, I'm reading, uh, I'll stick with 32X for now. What I want to say about this is I really think that it glosses over the amount of pressure that Sega of America was under uh, from Sega of Japan to release something new in 1994. Um, Joe Miller, who unfortunately is no longer with us, he's considered the father of the 32X. And I think it's really interesting to read this take because the way Ida Majiri's, uh quote comes across is that he was there, he was told... Sega of America wants to do the 32X and that they convinced Nakayama to do that. It, it feels like, I don't know, it, it really boils it down and really simplifies it. And I think it leads to the wrong conclusions, personally. Um, anyway, Sega 16, uh, another great site with some great interviews um, and, uh, and some great books. They ran an interview with Joe Miller. Uh, who, was, again, was the head of, what was his, I want to get his title right, Senior VP of Product Development for Sega of America and considered the father of the 32X. They ran an interview with him in 2013 um, where they asked him directly about the creation of the 32X. And again, this is going to be long, but uh, I want to call this out and also sort of um, counterpoint to Ida Majiri's uh, uh, statement there between... Uh, interviews with Shinobu Toyota from Sega of America, as well as this interview with Joe Miller, it sounds like uh, Hideki Sato, who is the head of consumer R&D uh, in Japan, and Hayao Nakayama were actually in the room when these when when the 32X was conceived and agreed to. They were there to say no, right? They could have said no. And that's sort of the thing that Joe Miller uh, brings across here. And I'm going to read this again in its entirety. It's a little bit long, but just, just bear with me. This is from a 2013 interview with Joe Miller, that was published on Sega 16, um, when asked about the 32X and the drama surrounding it, Joe responded, it's not as dramatic as all as it's not as dramatic at all as it's been made out to seem. There was no palace revolt, and I don't think there were any napkins involved, though we did have large stacks of sticky white paper, easel paper all over the place. We were drawing pictures and diagrams and doing lots of other things during those meetings, which took place at all hours in the rooms at our Las Vegas hotel. The 32X of Sega was famously conceived in a hotel room meeting at a winter CES, uh, like 10 months before it was released. Hideki Sato was right there with us, and I don't want to rehash history. I certainly don't want to rewrite it either, because there's been a lot said about it, about what exactly transpired there. Let me just put it this way. At the Consumer Electronics Show, and perhaps we even had a little warning before that, so the winter CES takes place in the first week of January. So maybe, maybe the December before that, I guess. Um, 
it became clear that there was a desire for us to take a product that was in the early design stages in Japan. It was a new platform. Nobody was codenaming, codenaming things Jupiter then, or even Mars at that point. And there was certainly an awareness that Japan had an idea of what they wanted to do with a Genesis platform that had more colors and was able to do 3D, take some of what we learned on the SVP chip, which was used for virtual racing, um, the polygon pusher chip, and integrate something that was more capable and build a new platform. It was still going to be a 16-bit machine with some limited 32-bit capabilities. So to me, that's huge. That's not Tom Kalinske. That's Joe Miller talking about the creation of the 32X. So what he's talking about here is that, and, and I'm sorry that I, there's probably if I did a bit of research, I could have figured out what exact machine he's talking about. A lot of people I think have said that they're talking about the originally um, considered uh, a cartridge only version of the Saturn. Although the way he describes it, that does not sound what he's talk, like what he's talking about. Sega of Japan, it sounds like they had, they were prototyping something or they were planning on prototyping something that was a mid-step between the Mega Drive and the Saturn that they were pushing the U.S. The Sega of America to release. Um, that's huge news and that's huge context to me in that what well, we just read Itamajiri a year ago saying Sega didn't want to release the Saturn they wanted to do this instead. Now we've got Joe Miller, the father of the 32X, saying, well, we didn't want to release this mid-tier thing they wanted to us to release. And we came up as the 32X as an alternative that would not alienate the installed base for the Genesis. That's how I read it. Moving, uh, carrying on with what Joe says in this interview, uh, when CES began, we started having discussions about the time frame of this because there was a strong desire for it. It was January, and there was a strong desire for whatever it was we were going to build to be available in the marketplace by Christmas of that year. That's a tall order for a start-from-scratch machine. Nothing exists, no board exists, no chipsets. A tall order for anybody at any organization to say, let's design hardware, let's build it, let's get development systems, let's have titles that are compelling enough to actually gain the attention of our customers, not alienate them, but actually cause them to be excited about it in basically six to nine months. So given all of that, we collectively, those of us on the technical side at SOA and the senior technical representatives that were in the sh at the show from Sega of Japan said, let's at least talk about alternatives. Let's at least spend some time exploring the art of the possible. And we did that. We had several designs, several architectures, several choices. Some were simpler than others and some were more complex, but they were all generally in the same category of what SOJ wanted to do with the new platform. One of them was to see if we could leverage the existing Genesis as a base and then add capability to it. Frankly, we had done as much with the Sega CD and add on that it started literally as a sit underneath platform. And that added new capability. It added a color layer, it added audio and a bunch of other capabilities and we sold around 6 million of those. The installed base from the Genesis at that time was something less than 40 million so we felt that model had some merit because it kept our customers from having to discard an existing platform that they had made an investment in already. Certainly our core customers had made an investment in several titles, several games on that platform. So we were looking for a, a way to leverage the best of what we had done and add that capability to something new. And the 32X evolved out of that. It certainly wasn't a revolt and it wasn't a matter of us or me standing up saying, no, that's a bad idea. I don't think I ever said that. I don't believe I ever said to anyone from SOJ who came over with the original idea that it was a bad idea because that wasn't the kind of relationship we had. I had more respect for all of them than that. But by the end of CES, we collectively came up with something we thought would work better. They thought it was pretty cool and said, this is great. Why don't you guys help us run with it? Help us figure it out, how to pull, how to pull this off. So... That paints a big, a much different picture. And I think that's the important context that we need from these Itamajiri quotes. He boils it down, and I don't know that he intended to do this, and maybe it's the translation, I don't know. But his quote boils it down to, Sega wanted to release the Saturn in 1994 in North America. 
uh, Sega of America wanted to release the 32X and they stood up and pushed back because they're Sega of America. From what Joe Miller, and unfortunately he's not here to, to defend or deny any of this, um, but from what Joe Miller was saying in this interview, that's not even remotely what happened. And I think it's important to point out in general that, again, Sega of America was stretched way too thin with way too many platforms, but those platforms came from Sega of Japan. This is not weird for the Sega culture. It's not weird to have multiple platforms out there. If you look at Sega of Japan and you look at them during the Mega Drive era, you had the Mega Drive, the Mega CD, the uh, Terra Drive, which was a PC that ran, <laughs> they were selling, that ran Mega Drive games. And then you had um, the, the, the Wonder Mega. It wasn't them, but still, the Wonder Mega. And you had the Iowa Mega CD Boombox. And you had the Mega Jet. Like, it wasn't weird for them to be doing multiple bits of hardware um, and, and the Pico they had as well. And all that stuff that came to Sega of America, I mean, it was coming from Sega of Japan. I don't know. Maybe they did have the ability to say, we don't want to release this, but, uh, you know, I'm guessing there was some pressure to do that. So again, it's, it's weird for me to say, well, Sega of America didn't know what they were doing. And Sega of Japan was right all along when it's the same culture. Um, pointing that out to the Nomad, because I thought it was interesting as I read more of this Joe Miller article, because the Nomad, again, was a mistake. Don't get me wrong. I don't know what the marketing plan was for the Nomad. Um, I thought it was a very cool piece of machinery, but it didn't make any sense to come out. He was asked about the Nomad as well, because of course it came out in North America. I, I don't know if it came out in the UK or Europe, but it didn't come out in Japan. So he was asked about, like, did Sega of America you know, ask them to make the Nomad. And his answer was, I was surprised when Nomad showed up one day. You know, it's one of those things that you really don't hear about, for me anyway, you don't know it's happening until you get a box from Japan. Oh, by the way, here's a portable Genesis for you that we're working on. I thought it was pretty cool. I still have mine in my collection. It leads me to believe that there was no grand scheme for it. Certainly it would have been released in Japan had it had a more specific business plan around it. So again, I think the, the blame lies on both sides there, as it does with the 32X, which is uh, there was probably pressure coming from Japan. But Tom Kalinske and Sega of America, I'm going to assume they had the ability to say, no, we're not doing that. And they didn't. So just, again, interesting, I think, interesting. Um, it's just It's just weird to me that that the blame tends to lie either on Japan or on America and not both. Speaking of blame on both sides. So here's the big thing that I wanted to talk about. And this is really going a long time. I really hope you're enjoying this. Itamajiri says in that talk, Sega of Japan wanted to release the Saturn in late 1994 when it released in Japan. Um, Again, I don't know if that's a mistranslation. I don't know if there's some nuance there that's being lost. But let's take that at face value because I have seen, again, and people are are uh, obviously have a right to their own takes. Nobody's right or wrong here. But I, I just, when I see people saying like, man, if it wasn't for Sega of America, we could have had the Saturn in 1994. Okay, yeah, we could have. I would say in that case, Sega of America actually was right to not release it in 1994. And here's the deal. So famously, the Saturn was released in May of 1995. It was a surprise release. Tom Kalinske has gone on record uh, many times over the last 10 or 15 years saying that <clears throat> it was Sega of Japan's call. He didn't have anything to do it. When Console Wars came out, and that was really sort of one of the things that, that we were starting to hear, I personally thought, that sounds strange to me. Because I wrote an article about the history of the Saturn for 1up.com, which you can find on uh, uh, archive.org. It's called uh, Saturn, the Pleasure and the Pain, where I got to interview Tom Kalinske. It was one of my like favorite things ever because I was, of course, a big Saturn or Sega fan. And Tom Kalinske was the guy. So I got to talk to him. And in that interview, he said that the 1995 release was his decision. The surprise launch was his idea. So I always found it kind of weird that now he was saying um, it was Sega's call, not his. 
However, after reading these excerpts from the Itamajiri talk, I'm starting to realize that sort of both positions make sense. I believe actually that there was a lot of pressure on Sega of America to release this thing earlier than September of 1995 and that it was Kalinsky's idea to not release it necessarily in November of 94, but to do the surprise launch in May 95 because he decided that made the most sense. If they were going to release before, I think it was September 2nd, which was supposed to be Saturn Day, um, that it made sense to release it during E3 because it was part of, you know, his his keynote could say, oh, by the way, it's out there, which I think was their tagline. It's out there. Um, and say it's, it's already in stores across the country, hoping that that would offset the multiple problems that that system had. Uh, the biggest one being the price. You know, they released it at 400 bucks and literally minutes after they said it's out there and it's 400 bucks, Steve Ray stands up and says, the PlayStation will be $300. Which was a surprise and took the air out of the, the wind out of Sega's sales. But also, if you go back and look at magazine articles at the time, uh, Sega knew they were going to release it at 300 Or they, they strongly suspected they were going to release the PlayStation at $300. Anyway, so... Yeah, let's talk about that. So, in 1995, when the Saturn released in May, it released with six games. It released at $400. It released with six games. Now, let's not... Let's let's take a look at that. So, the, the six games were Virtual Fighter, Daytona USA, Clockwork Knight, Panzer Dragoon, Worldwide Soccer, and Pebble Beach Golf. I'd say for me, you can make an argument that four of those were were system sellers in North America. Um, although Clockwork Knight, I think you have you you're, you're taking a stretch. You've got a copy of Virtual Fighter that was pretty good, way better than anything we'd seen at home. Let's put it that way. Um, you've got Daytona USA, which was a pretty lackluster port, but it was a super popular arcade game, so it made sense and that made it a system seller. Um, You've got Panzer Dragoon, which I don't know how you mark it ahead of time, but it was one of those things that when people discovered it, it's like, oh my God, this is amazing. This is a this is a surprise classic. Those three were really your pillars. Clockwork Knight was a great character action game back when those were super important, but it wasn't Sonic. And it's about an hour and a half long, I think, or two hours long. It's really easy. It's kind of weird. It's pre-Toy Story. So it doesn't even have that thing going for it where you're playing as a you're playing against evil toys and stuff like that. It's a good game, don't get me wrong, but it's it's kind of a weird game. Um, and then you've got two sports games for two sports that I mean golf is popular, but no one's going out to spend four hundred bucks to play Pebble Beach Golf, especially because I believe that was a port of an existing golf game. That was the type of game you were already playing on multimedia PCs at the time. And worldwide soccer, again, no amount of people in North America in 1995, not in big enough numbers anyway, were going out to buy a $400 console to play a soccer game. They just weren't. So let's back that up and say, all right, what if they released in November of 1995? And even for the sake of argument, let's assume that when a game was ready for release in Japan, it was ready for release on the same day in North America, which is crazy. It wasn't. It never is. Um, if they really, if they've launched this, if they had launched the Saturn in 1994, late 1994, out of those launch games, you would have had Virtua Fighter. That would be the only game out of those six that was ready for launch in 1994, late 1994. Daytona USA didn't come out in Japan until April of 1995. Uh, Clockwork Knight didn't come out in Japan until December of 1994. Again, and not a big system seller to begin with. Panzer Dragoon didn't come out in Japan until March of 1995. Worldwide Soccer, January 1995. And Pebble Beach, I think, was February 1995. So, on top of sort of a lackluster launch lineup, an expensive price, which, by the way, in November of 1994, the Saturn was still going to cost you 400 bucks. 
Um, the other big problem that Sega, the Saturn had in North America after the May launch, and I've had this debate with people before, is that after those six games, in the stretch between May 95 until the actual system, uh, planned system launch of September uh, 1995, there were something like four games released or three games released or something ridiculous like that. And they weren't, again, they weren't games that were going to sell systems. One of them was Bug. One of them was a stall. A stall, again, a gorgeous game, but kind of weird, right? Not something that's going to sell the system. Um, I think Mist came out. Again, a game that was super popular at the time, but on its own, not going to sell a $400 console. Um, and basically, if you're releasing in 1994 that lack of software problem is going to be exacerbated because, again, even the six games that we had in May of 1995, one of them would have been ready. One of them. It's Virtua Fighter, which was huge in Japan and was popular here, but wasn't enough to sell systems here. Well, I shouldn't say that. Wasn't enough, wasn't a big enough game here that the Saturn, clearly, that the Saturn could coast on that one game for months, which seems to me probably what it did in Japan. Um, it just wasn't popular enough here. Uh, otherwise, I sort of looked through to see what other sort of American-friendly games came out between the November launch in 1994 and the May launch in 1995. And there aren't a lot, and they aren't great. Uh, one of them was Myst. Myst was launched with the Saturn in 1994 in Japan, so that could have come here as well if there was a late 94 launch in North America. Uh, Gale Racer came out in December of 1994, which I think was Rad Racer. Um, it's terrible. It's a terrible port. It would have done more harm than good. Mansion of Hidden Souls, full motion video game. We've talked at length about th the fact that those weren't sellers. Shanghai Triple Threat. Again, a puzzle game I personally love. I have a copy of Shanghai Triple Threat sitting behind me, but again, not a system seller. Uh, Robotica, which did come out here. It's a pretty bog-standard, robot-based first-person shooter that was brought here by Acclaim. That was all... And by the way, with Shanghai, Robotica, and Minnesota Fats, we're already into March 1995. Um, Minnesota Fats Pool was another one that did come out here. And a stall, April 1995. By the way, I think also where I mentioned let's assume that these games will be available day and date in North America, when they were available in, at the same day they were uh, available in Japan. A stall, a great example. A stall, not a lot of localization needed, menus, and a little bit of voice acting. And that took uh, five months between the time it was released in Japan to the time it came out here. So, and that was when Sega was desperate for content. So I'm sure it was, they probably were trying to fast track it as much as they could. And that still took five months. So, that's what, to me, a late 94 launch for the Saturn looks like uh, in North America. For as bad as the May 95 launch was, a November 94 launch for the Saturn would have been suicide. Yes, you wouldn't have had the, uh, the eroded uh, trust in the Sega brand because the 32X wouldn't have existed. And that is super important. But releasing a $400 console with no software... For Christmas that year would have done the exact same amount of damage, in my opinion. By the way, in North America, Nintendo was still the main competition. Sony wasn't going to be around until September of 95. What was Nintendo doing in 1994 with Super Nintendo? Donkey Kong Country, NBA Jam, Final Fantasy 3, Mortal Kombat 2, Super Metroid, uh, The Lion King. All those games, just those six games just sort of doing a quick search of games that came out in 94. So against a lineup like that, which, by the way, would also be on the Genesis, some of them, you're going to launch a $400 console with Virtua Fighter and maybe Myst and maybe Clockwork Knight the next month, maybe. Oh, not, although not realistically. Like, that's where, to me, the whole... Th the whole thinking of, oh, imagine we could have had a Saturn at the end of 94, makes zero sense. Yes, we could have, but it would have been a disaster. It would have been a bigger disaster than it was in May of 1995, in my opinion. 
the other thing that I think is really important that I think is a strong point in Sega of America's column as far as saying we don't want to release this at the end of 94 in North America is, again, context here. When the Super Nintendo came out in 1991 in North America, I don't know that people remember this, there was a big backlash because the NES was so successful. Everybody had one. And they'd invested, parents had invested a lot of money in this console and their games. And there were still good games coming out for the NES. Not so much anymore, but there were still good games coming out in, in 1990. I mean, was it Mario 3 in 1990? Now they were releasing this new console that was more expensive than the NES. And it was incompatible with the previous games, with the previous systems games that everybody owned a ton of. And there were, I mean, there, you can look it up on YouTube. There were news articles run with angry parents uh, saying, you know, I, I can't believe they're doing this to us. Um, and it was actually something that Sega of America, this was pre-Kalinsky, marketed against because they were in the enviable position of not having a super popular console uh, on the market. However, the console they did have, the Master System, they had a converter that you could plug into the, the power base converter that you could plug into the top of your Genesis. So if you were one of the few people who had Master System games, if you bought a new Genesis, there was an avenue for you to play your old Master System games on your Genesis. I, I've spoken to, uh, to Al Nilsson multiple times because uh, he's just a super friendly guy. Uh, I've spoken to him for the show. And one of the things that he had said, and I think he said this in interviews elsewhere too, was that the, uh, the the power base converter was one of the most important peripherals the uh, that Sega had that nobody bought because they could at least point to it and say we didn't abandon you like Nintendo abandoned their customers and so you got to remember that mindset here is that the Genesis was popular it, it owned about it still owned around fifty percent of the market it, it fluctuated obviously forty five or whatever forty five to fifty two percent of the market. You're releasing a new expensive console while the 16-bit games are still kind of at their height. There's still some major stuff coming out. I mean, you look at the Genesis as well in 1994. Don't forget, Sonic 3. Everyone bought Sonic 3 earlier that year. And Sonic and & Knuckles came out later in the year, right? Um, Streets of Rage 3 was was there as well. So I'm not saying that the, the Genesis... And you had NBA Jam and you had Mortal Kombat 2 on the console as well. There were big sellers that year on the Genesis that you would drop a $400 console at the end of the year and tell your fan base, which was pushing around, which was around 30 million, I think at the time, maybe 40 million at the time, say, oh, all that stuff you bought six months ago doesn't work on this. But there's also no games for this. And there won't be for the next six months. Um, so to me, that's just... I think that's a win in the Sega of America column. See, and, and I think, let's go back. The other thing that I wanted to touch on here to make my next point is, really, Sega of America was right in that um, the system was too expensive. It abandoned a strong Genesis user base and the software wasn't ready. And this isn't something that they have said uh, retroactively. I mean, they have said it retroactively, but it's not something that was new retroactively. One of the things that I did when I was preparing for this video was to go back and look at, especially Next Generation Magazine. When Next Generation Magazine came out, it was right around the time in North America, it was right around the time that these consoles were getting ready to release. So the first four or five issues of Next Generation Magazine, which read like a trade paper more than a, the consumer magazine, which is one of the reasons I loved it, they're chock full of interviews with people like Steve Race and, and Tom Kalinske and Yu Suzuki and, you know, uh, Howard Lincoln. All these people that were right in the middle of the on the cusp of launching this new generation of hardware. And even back then, um, and there's something else we haven't touched on yet. Even back then, Kalinske was saying and he was and, and in the Console Wars documentary, you can see him saying this in at a, an interview at a trade show at the time. The system's too expensive. It's too expensive for mass market appeal. He said in one of those interviews, actually multiples of those interviews, $300 was the mass market price point for the next console generation and that the Saturn couldn't get there. It's called out in this fiscal year 
review. Uh, he called, but he was calling it out at the time. Um, the other thing that I think is really important to kind of the next point that I'm going to make, also in those early issues, Yu Suzuki is quoted multiple times. Yu Suzuki. So probably at that time, one of the two developers who were the face of Sega, who were the face of Sega development, Yu Suzuki, super, super important and popular because, of course, Virtua Fighter was a thing, right? And AM2 was releasing the best games. Daytona was huge, was releasing the best games in the arcade and their best games in the arcade and about to be releasing the biggest, most important games on uh, on the Saturn. So him and along with Yuji Naka. Uh, I'd say we're the two faces of the development side of Sega. He's quoted multiple times in those first issues about how difficult the Saturn is to design for, how difficult it is to get um, the most out of that system. And I remember uh, my friends and I, when we would troll through these magazines, because that's how you got your information, seeing that and saying to each other, like, well, that doesn't bode well. If you've got the face of Sega saying the system's too hard to make games for, what kind of third-party support can you expect? Uh, the other thing that came that came through in a lot of those interviews, again, this is at the time. This isn't people rewriting history. This is at the time. I think it's in late 95 or mid-95 you start to see that they finally got some... They were finally starting to get some good developer tools, development tools uh, around this system. And they could start creating really good stuff. And I think it's interesting because that's right around the time that you start to see things like Virtua, Virtua Cop, uh, Virtua Fighter 2, Sega Rally. That was when the system really started to hit its stride software wise. You could tell that things were getting better, right? Um, but again, it's, it's right in these, it's right in the pages of these magazines. So it's not revisionist history. It, it is what was happening at the time. Um, so Looking back on it now, I have massive respect for what Nintendo did with the N64. As a consumer, it sucked. I wanted an N64 and it was taking way too long to come out. But again, Console Wars actually has a clip of Howard Lincoln uh, announcing a delay, a further delay, who knows how many delays it was, saying that the software wasn't ready. That was the position Nintendo was in. That was the position Sega was in. In a perfect world, um, they had a strong Genesis. They had a strong Genesis market still happening. Um, you know, I think it was still five million in sales the year that this fiscal year uh, review um, came out. Um, and they had a system that was didn't have a lot of software, was too expensive, and nobody knew how to program for, you didn't have good software development tools to give to your partners. Oh, and by the way, they didn't have a lot of them. That's the other thing. With an early 94 launch, there weren't enough systems to go around in May of 95. I'm not sure why a late 94 launch would have been better somehow. But Nintendo had the right idea. The difference between Sega and Nintendo at that point was that the, N the, the Super Nintendo was massively popular in Japan. Top system in Japan. We're talking like 94 now. And 95. Um, Mario was their flagship franchise, right? So that was going to lead in Japan and the US for the N64. Um, so they could collectively say, we need to wait. And we're going to wait. And they could wait. Plus, they had a lot, they had a lot of money. Because they only had two major platforms going at the time, Super Nintendo and Game Boy, both selling really well. On the flip side with Sega, and this is not a knock on Sega of Japan, but each region between America and Japan, they were in much different positions at that time. Sega of America, Genesis was popular. It was still selling. They had way too much other hardware, and they were clearly, you know, inundated with, with rotting stock. But the Genesis was still selling. Um, so it was true that it wasn't time to move on. In Japan, the Mega Drive was not selling anymore. If you look at their releases, Sega wasn't releasing a lot of games for it. A lot of the games that Sega was actually releasing for the Mega Drive in Japan at this point were actually ports of American games. Um, but either way, they were a distant third behind the PC Engine, which I don't even know was still selling or not, 
and the, the Super Nintendo, the Super Famicom, right, was just miles and miles ahead of them. They, I, I think they ended up selling something like maybe I, I have it written down here somewhere, but it's a low number. I think it's less than ten million in Japan. Sega of Japan had to move on, right? They needed to move on. It was time for them. It was probably past due for them to move on to new hardware. Um, the other problem is Sonic, not nearly as important or popular in Japan, is my understanding as he was essential to the American market for Sega of America, he wasn't for Japan. So you've got Sonic Team out making games like Knights instead of concentrating on the character that's going to sell games in North America because they're focused on the Japanese market, which I totally get. That doesn't make them wrong. It just, it puts Sega of America in an untenable position. Um, it worked for Nintendo because their Japanese and American counterparts were pretty much in lockstep. And that's to say the N64, I don't think was a huge success. It wasn't the success coming off the super Nintendo. It wasn't that sort of that level of success that I'm sure they wanted. Um, Sega didn't have, I think the money or the, the cachet in Japan to wait. Um, whereas Sega of America probably could have rode out the year without the 32 X. Um, yes, it would have been diminishing returns, but really, the sweet spot, I think, uh, for the Saturn launch was September. Because you had big software coming out at the end of 1995. Although it was still coming out a little bit too late. If the PlayStation didn't exist, the sweet spot for the Saturn launch was late 96, in my opinion. Um, but then the PlayStation blew the doors wide open. So... All that is to say, oh, sorry, there's one more thing that I wanted to touch on here. I, I'm, I'm jumping around in my notes here. All that is to say, though, that um, Sega, was, Sega of America was put in an untenable position. I don't think there was a right, I don't think there was a right answer. The 32X wasn't it. The, the surprise launch wasn't it. But I also think they were kind of in a position where they were screwed. If they'd waited until, if they'd waited until September, maybe things might have been better. But see, then you're going to be you're going to be directly comparing Daytona to Ridge Racer, uh, Virtua Fighter to Toshinden. Um, it just the Saturn wasn't going to look good. Um, I think it's important, and I touched on it with the Yu Suzuki thing too, um, that the Saturn was too hard to develop for. You see it in this fiscal year thing. I'm not saying Gray Matter was some amazing AAA studio, but people couldn't get a hold of the system, and People didn't have good development tools to get a hold of the system, uh, which, again, Yu Suzuki bore out in mid-95, early 95, when he was interviewed about, about the Saturn and developing on the Saturn. Um, and I will go back to it and say, I'm using Knights as an example. You have to look at what created Sega's success in North America in the early 90s, and that was all about being cool. That was all about stuff like Streets of Rage. And yes, you look back at the old Sonic games and they're really cutesy now, but they were they were edgy at the time, right? And Sonic as a character was edgy all the, at the time. And then you've got Knights, which is beautifully creative. It's a fantastic game. It, it, it's, it's so good. But how do you market that to a 15-year-old? A 15-year-old boy who's watching MTV who's used to, again, Streets of Rage, who's used to Sonic, who's expecting Sega to be the cool company. How do you market that? How do you market the Saturn, which is $100 too expensive, against the PlayStation that has better looking games, that has more exciting games, and that was marketed better? Um, I, I think they were in an unwinnable position. I think they always were. I think they made it worse. So that's me saying Sega of Japan shares a lot of the blame for the failure of the Saturn in North America, although they were very popular, they were very successful in Japan. I will not, however, say that Sega of America was blameless. I'm just saying, I think we need to balance this out a little bit because how do you market that stuff? I'll tell you how you don't market that stuff is how Sega marketed it. Sega of America marketed it. What the hell they were thinking with the uh, theater of the eye gross out ads that they were doing that were not annoying, or not cool, they were annoying, and they were weird, and they were kind of gross. 
uh, I don't know what they were doing. You know, so they already took what was an almost impossible position and made it that much harder on themselves um, by just absolutely dropping the ball on the marketing. So I will say they shoulder the blame for that. I think the 32X debacle has to be shared between both companies or both branches of the company. I really do. Um, and I think the Saturn's failure in North America needs to be shared by both branches of the company. Uh, although Sega of America didn't make it any easier on themselves. So, um, yeah, that was basically the point that I wanted to make. So the conclusion here being, it's really interesting that this stuff has come out, the, the leaked document in particular, because we, uh, to, to, to steal, honestly, from, from Pandemonium, because I listened to to his uh, his chat about it, where he says, like he said, we always knew things were bad. We had no idea they were this bad. Um, so it is fascinating to see this kind of internal information and to get a real feel for really the position that Sega of America was in in 95, 96. Um, but the real reason why I wanted to record this is is the takes that I've been seeing, especially since the Itamajiri, um quotes came out in that, again, yeah, you can put you can put the blame on the shoulders of Tom Kalinske and Sega of America. And I really feel like a lot of us in the retro community uh, are ready for something like that because uh, Tom and the other people from Sega have sort of been able to openly, I don't want to say rewrite, but write the history of uh, what happened at Sega in the mid 90s and haven't really received a lot of pushback. So, and again, Tom himself has been kind of deified. Although I will say, uh, I spoke to um, uh, Shinobu Toyota at one point uh, for when I inter I did an interview with him for some magazine I was working on, and um, he was very quick to call out how amazing Kalinsky was at his job too. So while he has been a little bit deified uh, in the press, uh, largely due to the stories he's telling, um, he is highly respected from the by the people who were there. <clears throat> so I think that's important to note either way. I'm kind of at the end of my ramble here. This has been a lot longer than I expected it to be. I really hope you've enjoyed it because I do want to start doing some more on-camera stuff for Generation 16 um, with my little iPhone slash ring light setup that you can see in my glasses. <laughs> um, but yeah, again, this doesn't really fit the, the chronological order of anything to do with what I'm doing uh, on Generation 16, but I just feel strongly enough about this because... I was, I paid so much attention to it while it was happening, as it as it died in the wool. Diehard Sega fan, ninety ninety five, and, and the ensuing years were rough. Um, so, you know, I am passionate about this as well, even though I don't really cover Saturn in any of this, any of the content that I make. Um, I always have been passionate about that console and about sort of the 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 rise to glory and the fall from grace of Sega of America that happened in the space of like eight years um, that I think it's, I felt it important to, to put this together. I had a lot of people saying they love to hear what I think about this stuff. So now you've heard what I think about this stuff. So I really appreciate you sitting and watching all this again. Let me know, let me know in the comments below a, if you like this, if you like me doing stuff like this um, and B, if you, uh, if you have any opinions on, on what I've let's debate it. I am open to hear other opinions on this. Uh, I'm sure I'm not completely right. I'm sure there's details that I've missed here. So I would love to have some kind of conversation about that in the comments. Um, if you like this kind of thing too, this is similar, although I don't go nearly in, as in depth. This is similar to what I offer to uh, patrons who sign up for the uh, the weekly commute. But uh, yes, if you are interested in supporting the show, please do take a look at Patreon um, and please do subscribe. Uh, again, thank you so much for listening. I look forward to chatting and debating about this in the comments, and uh, I'll be back with a regular episode of Generation 16 very soon. Goodbye. We are five years away from entering the 21st century. Humankind stands on the edge of the interactive age. You have come a long way. But are you ready for the future? Introducing Sega Saturn. Aww. Hit it. 
Sega's next generation gaming platform, revolutionary sports and arcade gameplay, all with amazing new 3D experiences never before possible on home game systems. Wow. Sega Saturn. It's how you play the game. <laughs> What's happening? What's happening? Sega. Saturn! Go farther than you have ever gone before. Sega Saturn. Play your games in the 21st century and leave the rest of the world behind. <laughs>